Okay. So the question, one of the questions uh, yesterday was about thinking through uh, some insight that one feels one has. Certainly we're going to do that, but there, there is a danger of trying to match experience to some text or some teacher's instructions, which then can be a function of doubt. Is, is this what he means? Does he mean that? Uh, does that match to that? And for me, insight is more a thing of confidence. So that's why I use the, the analogies of craft. They make a lot of sense to me. So I've been, I've just figured out how to do a herringbone design as I keep yakking away here. And, and it's very complicated when you're trying to get it from a book. I don't have a teacher, but there is YouTube. And so I struggle and struggle and struggle and it doesn't work and, and then click. So I have insight because it's pragmatic. I understand how it works. Now I can explain it afterwards or not, but I know how it works. And the more I do it, it, I, I get, it gets kind of embodied. You know, if anyone, if you do woodwork or sewing or any kind of a craft, it, it just starts to be a part of your whole body, your intuition. So, like this pattern, I have to, let me see, I have to raise uh, shafts one and two, then two and three, then four and three, and then four and one. No, then three and four, then four and one. And then I have to throw... Uh, what did I do? Blue, gray, blue, gray, blue, blue, gray, blue, gray, blue, gray, blue, and so on and so forth. And then I have to. So that sounds complicated, but it's not. You know, once you once you get it going, and then I I just know. Oh, that's the wrong leg, or no, that color sequence is long, wrong, and and it becomes a part of my my being, as it were, my body. And, and I think that's what I think insight is about. You can match it, you can match it to words, but the, the danger there is, is the hindrance of doubt. And doubt is both one of the hindrances to uh, Nivaranas for when we talk about meditation, and it's one of the three fetters, Vichikicha. And as a fetter, it is quite significant because it's very hard to see doubt as an object because the mood of doubt is an objective experience just as the mood of anger is an objective experience. Anger is much easier to notice. Um, doubt is more difficult because it's, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it, it, it's a function of, of moha, of what we call of each, uh, ignorance. Not ignorance in, in a sense of stupidity, but it's... it's um, it's very deluding. It can be very, very deluding. And yet doubt is very important. And if I didn't have doubt, I couldn't question, I couldn't analyze. I, so it's not a dismissal of doubt, but in terms of, of realizing the silence and peace of, of, of being or transcendence, doubt is, an, if you take it in terms of like objective movement, doubt is unpleasant to the intellectual, who is comfortable with uh, conclusions and that we work in the world of doubt and conclusions, doubt and conclusions, which is fine. Uh, but in this sense, the, the, the problem becomes one of constantly being engaged with thinking. And as long as I'm engaged with a sankara called thought, I cannot realize the asankata, the unconditioned. So that's the logic of it. Um, so when, when, when to, use, to use doubt, to me, in, uh, kind of as a craft, you can ask a question, but it's more like a pragmatic question. What, why? What, what is the feeling of this now? Something like that, whatever you want. But the, the tendency to not see doubt as doubt um, gets you in a circle of, of Conclusion, doubt, conclusion, doubt, conclusion, doubt. So to actually say, I don't know. And that's one of the great liberating things about being a teacher. When I, you know, people would ask, like, I'll always be afraid of poly scholars. 
oh, 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 oh God, now he's going to ask me what that word means. And I've been a monk <laughs> for 20 years. I don't know. <laughs> kind of feel really intimidated with poly scholars. And then I just, well, I don't know. <laughs> Do you know? And it was great, because I don't know. But that's actually knowing that you don't know. And that's liberating, isn't it? If I know, I know, I don't know. So doubt is, you know, doubt is a very, very, very tricky one. So that was to that question. But in the, um, this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness, the uh, Buddha's words and loving kindness. There's a phrase at the end there that often I've, I've pondered, why? Why is that phrase popped right at the end? By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one is not born again into this world. I said, why? Why there? Why there? And finally, I, 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 my pragmatic conclusion, my pragmatic is, is that um, it's an exercise I'm doing. If I follow that sutta and I just agree with it as I mean, beautiful principles, inspiring ideals, then sure, we all can agree to that. But as a practice, you actually like take a line and you do it. Um, this is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be upright. Just as a mother loves her child, her only child, so should one cherish all living beings. Wow. I mean, what a phrase. But if you actually do that, rather than, oh, that's inspiring, isn't it? And then watch the cat video. <laughs> then, of course, you, you're not really doing the sutta. You're not practicing it. You, you're maybe agreeing with it. And, and it's more like a sentiment. But if, if I practice that and actually do the words, then this, it activates this part of my being. You know, this, this is very important in my practice to activate this rather than the thinking mind. And if I activate that, and then I get to the end of the sutta, by not holding to fixed views. Huh? Okay. So then I contemplate, what would a fixed view be? Okay. Uh, injustice. I have a sense that <clears throat> something is unjust. And everyone agrees with me. We all agree this is unjust. And I can't do anything about it. Maybe it's in my family, and maybe it's like a horrible custody agreement or some kind of blame and censure in a workplace which is unfair and politically motivated. Da, 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 all, all the different ways we can um, experience injustice towards myself or towards others. And I'm, I'm there. I'm, I have a view that this is not right. Now, that view is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with that, and, and if we didn't have those views, we wouldn't have a kind of system of social justice. But here, what is holding to fixed views would be that view would come up as memory, and then it would stimulate thinking. It's not fair. It's not right. I mean, it's obviously irrational. It's just no good, and I really don't like this. And why is it that when we hold views, <coughs> They, <clears throat> they stimulate a strong sense of self. I don't know. I don't think Bruno does that. <clears throat> right? I can't figure it out. I mean, have you ever thought about that? Just, you just observe your mind having an opinion and making a problem out of it. What? Well, why would it do that? That's really weird. But there it is. That's how it works. <laughs> I didn't design I don't know who designed this. And that's what we mean by attachment, that thinking process. So what to do? Well, if I'm following that sutta, and I've, <coughs> let's say I've embodied that beginning part of the sutta to, to hear, to my heart, to what it actually feels like to cherish all living beings, then I'll notice that the, the thinking of my um, sense of injustice is in thought. So then I can practice going back to the heart. So the injustice comes up as memory, it's stimulated by someone saying something, a news event, and then 
that stimulates this held position shouldn't be this way held position i'm not saying it's wrong i'm not saying we live in some kind of complacent cave type existence but how do you so what i'm saying pragmatically how do you actually work with something like that well you 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 do you lay down in yoga nidra and or you sit in your chair and now you just watch that the thinking mind being stimulated by that memory and then where is that oh yeah certainly pressure in the head and then you allow your your attention to try to float down through the throat down into the body let it float down and i don't know how to describe that either people say what do you mean what do you do i don't know i just i, don't, I just do it <laughs> so the only imagery i can get is is you allow attention to to, to kind of sink through the throat down and abide here now the the again this is just my weaving <laughs> um, the, the 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 held view will be constantly um, stimulated by information so it'll come up in that same thinking pattern now again I say I've done everything I could to alleviate the injustice and then it comes up again and then oh, there's a pressure in the head. So I begin to be very, very skillful at noticing what a held view does to my body, just as I become more and more skillful at treadling the loom, or become more and more skillful at throwing the weft. And as I, as I see that pressure in the head, and I've, I've trained in the beginning of that sutta, you know, I've, opened, I've learned to open the heart, I've learned to abide at the heart, goes down, goes down to the heart, oh, okay, that's relaxed, that's at ease. And then bang, it's stimulated again, oh, and that's at ease. If you have, so, like if there's some really difficult family situation that you just can't get around, some discord, or and, and it's natural, isn't it? We all have those things, and you do your best you can. How do you, how do you take that as a practice? So the any instance of this then becomes an instance of all held views. You begin to understand, okay, that's how I can work with that. And then you will be better at talking, no doubt. You, you'll have a much clearer uh, ability to speak into the injustice if you're given the opportunity. So it doesn't, it doesn't negate intelligence. Actually, I think it heightens it because you're not holding to a fixed view some and then take that to any any fixed view you have a, a view that you of self-disparagement based on self-criticism uh, yeah i shouldn't have done that i shouldn't have done that oh where is that that's in the head and then you take it down to the heart so you got to do the first part of the practice and somehow alive and or make life or what's the word embody the feeling of compassion and, and 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 openness and so on so many people don't you know they're not so alive there they're very very much into the thinking mind and if you're if life is analytical and you're you're using the brain a lot for analysis then that's going to be it's just the place it kind of goes to by not holding so by not holding to fixed views the poor hearted one is not born again into this world what is born again into this world is the sense of self arising as an entity it's not right they're wrong i'm right or they're they're terrible and it's unfair or that's the sense of self that's that's what rebirth can be considered not born again into this world the world of, of suffering Make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's 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 a serious bit of suffering we can get around that, those kinds of things. So that is really what, like in Theravada Buddhism, especially in Thailand, Ajahn Chah, they would talk a lot about the eight worldly wins: praise and blame, gain and loss, um, good fortune, misfortune, pain, pleasure. These dualities that are just part of samsaric existence: praise and blame success failure they come and they go and and there's no way you cannot if you have one you're going to have the other and that is one of the great stumbling blocks 
of realizing that which transcends the worldly dharmas. So when they come out, when, when failure, perceived failure, arises uh, through life circumstances, then you have to be very diligent. Because if you're not diligent, the, the language of the inner world can really become quite hurtful and harmful. So it, the, 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 like by being here, by doing a retreat, we're kind of preparing ourselves for the, those eventualities. I, I, I don't wish it on you, right? But <laughs> life, life just happens that way. And, and then, because you you've, you've, you've maybe have a, a sense of how to do it, we have more body awareness, then, then we need to create a space in our, in our normal lives uh, where we can stop and witness and allow these things to be known in this way. Because if you don't give it time, it just gets pushed down and pushed down and pushed down, and it'll come up, or it'll feel as, as stress. So, like I keep saying to everyone, what's the best way to, to, to improve your practice? Do morning practice. If you want to meditate, meditate. If you don't want to meditate, and it's so important. Because then, like you notice now, if, if, if a memory of some something that happened to you this year, a very painful memory comes up, you can really work with it, can't you? Because you don't have to be a personality. You can really be with it and understand it. And, and so that's our opportunity. But you want to obviously carry that through throughout your life. Okay? So let's do some meditation.